Welcome back to the course. Um, in this uh, series of sessions, we're going to be talking about deep learning. This is one of the new chapters in the second edition of Introduction to Statistical Learning. Deep learning is a new name for neural networks, which became popular in the 1980s. There were lots of successes, hype, and, and great conferences. That's where the start of the Neurips sequence were and the Snowbird sequence. And Rob, you and I went, we were regular attendees of those conferences. Yeah, from about 85 to into the 90s. Yeah. Initially, one of the attractions, apart from all the really interesting work, was they were held in ski resorts. So it was an opportunity to both learn interesting new stuff and, and get some skiing in. Then along came support vector machines, random forests and boosting, which you've learned about in this course or about to learn about. And the neural networks took a bit of a back seat. They re-emerged around 2010 with a new name, Deep Learning. And by the 2020s, um, they became very dominant and successful. And they used all over the place now. So part of the success was due to the vast improvements in computing power much bigger training sets and software. The main software platforms are TensorFlow, which is a, a Google software, and PyTorch, which comes from Facebook. But much of the credit goes to three pioneers and their students. There's Jan LeCun, Jeffrey Hinton, and Yoshio Benjo, who received the 2019 ACM Turing Award for their work in, in neural networks. And you'll find on, on the website for the course, what we do, uh, Trevor and I have an interview with Jeff Hinton talking about the history of neural networks and, and their development since the 80s. Yes, and, and we've known these three gentlemen pretty much for their whole uh, careers. Um, uh, Jan LeCun was at um, Bell Labs um, in, the, in the 80s and, and 90s, and I was there at the same time. Yosha Benjo was a, a frequent visitor, and, uh, and Rob worked with... Uh, um, Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto. Okay, so let's get started. We'll start off with a really simple single layer neural network, sometimes called a feed forward um, neural network. And neural networks are often displayed using what's known as um, network diagrams. And here we see such a network diagram. In the orange, we've got the input layer. Here in this example, we've got four variables. And then we have what's known as a hidden layer. And there's five units in the hidden layer here. Yeah? And then there's the output layer. And the way you think of the hidden layer is you think of them as transformations of the inputs. The A stand for activations, and we'll get into the, the detailed notation in a moment. So where's the observed data? Is it all observed? Um, Rob, this is observed. The Xs are observed. And the output Y is observed, that's a response, but the A's aren't observed. I, I actually knew the answer. But you yeah. knew the answer. <laughs> no, I thought it would be good to explain it. <laughs> and these, these activations are computed. In fact, in this equation over here, they named yeah, HK of X. So the Kth activation is a transformation of the inputs X. And these little arrows indicate linear combinations of these X's that feed into each of these hidden units. And here, yeah, hk of x is expanded as a function, which is going to be a nonlinear function, of a linear combination of the inputs. And each of those linear combinations is different. So the linear combination feeding into a1 is different to the one feeding into a2. So what you can think of is these are transformations that are learned when you train the network. These transformations are learned on the fly. So. Let's look in a little bit more detail. The AK, these are the activations. As I said, the HK of X, and we can think of it as a nonlinear transformation of a linear function. And they're called, again, activations in the hidden layer. Now, these nonlinear functions, there's a, a choice, and they're called activation functions. And two that are popular are the sigmoid and the rectified linear. So in the early neural networks, the sigmoids were popular. So you can see it's a nonlinear function. It takes sort of a standardized range, look, z is running from minus four to four, and it maps it to the interval zero, one, in like a, a smooth transformation. It's actually the same transformation that's used in logistic regression. The black one 
is the one that's more popular today. It's called a ReLU function, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit. And look what it does. It's, it's zero up to, if, if z is less than or equal to zero, it returns zero. And after zero, it returns a, non it returns a linear function. So it basically truncates at zero. And since there's an intercept in each of these um, transformations, what zero on the z scale, you know, can move around because of that intercept. So why nonlinear? Well, if they weren't nonlinear, for example, if the activation function was linear, then the whole network would just be a linear model. Because then you would have linear transformations of linear variables become, you know, you just get one big linear model. So if you didn't do nonlinear activations, it would just be a big linear model. And so again, the, the activations are the, like derived features um, that we learn when we train the model. And then with all that in place, you fit the model by minimizing, uh, say for, for regression and squared error loss, you just minimize the sum of squares like you would for regression. But this F, right, so F was at the, the end of the pipeline here, F encompasses a lot of parameters, right? There's the parameters going from the hidden layer to the output layer, and there's the parameters going from the inputs to the, all the hidden units. So there's a lot of parameters. And you'll see that's something that characterizes neural networks. There can be lots of parameters. So let's get on to a, a more serious example. So this is the MNIST digit data. These digit data, this is like a test bench for neural networks. In fact, I would say neural networks really started with handwritten digit classification. So you can see that these handwritten digits have been scanned in, right? They've been, they've been written with a pen or pencil, typically taken from envelopes. And they've been scanned in and they've been normalized in this case to 28 by 28 grayscale images. What that means is, yeah, we've blown up some three of the images, the threes, fives, and eights for this example here. And so there's 28 rows and 28 columns, um, and each pixel is a grayscale value, taking on values between zero and 255. And what that means is that grayscale value basically calculates how much of the ink is in that little pixel. If it's zero, there's nothing. And, and then the, depending on the amount of ink, it goes, can go all the way up to 255. I guess one of the reasons you normalize is that the, the input features are the pixels here, right? So we want somehow a pixel in each image, so each three, to mean the same thing, to mean the same place relative to the three. R same place. Exactly. So if you had the images all different sizes and shapes, you know, that would be much harder to achieve. But when you see the conv convolutional neural network coming up, that'll, it'll make that, take that even further, right? It'll, yes. it'll be invariant to, to the, the position of the pixel in, this, in essence. So along with this example, the, you come with a class label, which of course are the digits zero to nine. So this is a multi-class classification problem. You've got 10 classes and the input features are these 28 by 28, which is, 784 pixels per image. You can think of that just as a set of inputs per image, and we need to use the values in those inputs to classify the, the digits. So in this case, we're going to build a two-layer feed-forward neural network, um, which is just a more complicated version of the one we showed you before. And it's going to have 256 units at the first layer, and 128 units at the second layer, and of course the output layer has got 10 units. And if you count up all the parameters, there's 235,146 parameters altogether. And in this community, these are known as weights. I remember some of the first times we saw these kinds of models, we thought, how can you have four times as many parameters as observations? Exactly. In an overfit, right? So we're gonna talk quite a bit about how, how we avoid overfitting how in, this, in these kinds of models. I mean, look at that, 60,000 training observations right. and 235,000 yeah. weights. Sounds crazy. Yeah. So here's the network diagram. So there's the inputs. So of course, 
we've got dot, dot, dots. These are going up to, you know, all the pixels in the image. So that's the input layer. There's the first hidden layer with 256 hidden units. And all these little arrows represent all the weights going from every input to every hidden unit. And then likewise, we have a second hidden layer, which takes as inputs the values from the first hidden layer, and again, fully connected with weights going from every layer one unit to every layer two unit. And then finally, we have an output layer, which has got 10 units, represented in the digits zero, one through up to uh, through nine, okay? And these actually estimate a probability of being each of the digits, and then those lead to a prediction. And this is sort of a historical comment. This is, this is an example of a deep net. I mean, it's got two hidden layers. In the, in the 80s, the original neural networks typically had one hidden layer. And uh, uh, Tommy Poggio from MIT gave a talk at Stanford a few years ago. And he said in the 80s, when the neural nets came out with single hidden layers, um, some approximation theorems were proven by mathematicians showing that if you make the hidden layer, L1 here, uh, have as many, an arbitrary number of hidden units, you can approximate any smooth function well. So the conclusion from the community was we only ever need one hidden layer. And in Tommy's opinion, that set the field back by 30 years because people just, they, they didn't bother with trying to, with, uh, with deep nets, more than one layer, they just used one layer. And now this is not to criticize mathematicians who were sure very clever in their proofs, but it just makes the point that you shouldn't take mathematics too seriously, right? It, and sometimes it, it makes assumptions and as we'll see later in this lecture, what's, what's the... Uh, we have, we're going to show you a network that's got 50 layers. Right. And there's a good reason for it. it works really yeah. well. So we'll talk a little bit more about the function of these layers. But the, the point is, with, with, deep layer, with deep networks with multiple layers, you can really get much better performance. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the output layer. So what we have is coming from the second hidden... So the, we've had to introduce some notation now because we've got multiple layers. So we go from the second hidden layer to the output layer, and let's suppose that computes some activation ZM. Then the output activation function encodes what's known as a softmax function. And this is the, the same function that's used in multi-class logistic regression. So it just takes these, these 10 real numbers and puts them through this nonlinear transformation, which turns them into numbers between zero and one that also sum to one. So this M here is going from class zero up to class nine. And, and if you sum these quantities up, you'll get a probabilities that sum to one. And then also like in multi-class list logistic regression, we fit the model by minimizing the negative multinomial log likelihood. It's also known as cross entropy in this field. And here it is here. It's just that you've got your, your training data with true labels and the true labels are, are represented by this this set of numbers y. So y is a, is a vector of 10 numbers, and it'll be one if the true class for observation i is m, otherwise it'll be zero. And in this field, it's, that's known as one hot encoded. The, what do we call that in statistics, right? Dummy variables? Dummy variables. I think, that, I think their marketing department's definitely better than ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you think about this now, if we've summed from m going from zero to nine, but only one of these y's is one. And so that'll pick up the log of the probability of the observed label, right? And that's therefore the log likelihood. And we take the negative of the log likelihood. So we're going to tell you about details of fitting neural networks later. But let's look at the results on these data set. So we show you two neural network results. And the one gets 2.3% errors. The other gets 1.8% errors. If you just fit a multinomial logistic regression, you get 7.2% errors. And if you fit linear discriminant analysis, which is another way of fitting multi-class um, classification models, you get 12.7% errors. So these are substantial improvements over these pre-existing and, and more simple methods. And again, this problem with the digits spelled one of the early successes for neural networks in the 90s. So we mentioned two forms of ridge regularization, which you know about, and dropout regularization, which we will tell you about a little bit later. And these both are essential and help um, give this good performance. And again, we'll give you some more details of that later.
Now, we should point out that this is a very overworked problem. These aren't the best rates you, you're going to see. You can find reported rates that are less than 0.5% misclassification error. For this particular data set, this test data set, the human error rate is reported at a, around 0.2% or 10, 20 of the 10,000 test images. But I think so many people have tried and, and fit models to this. Right. So it could be a case that you know, we over training on the test set.